So here we are back out of the classroom setting again for one more video. Uh, this time we're going to get into the integument system. Now the reason we stick with the screen for this particular topic is that it is very diagram heavy. Uh, basically, and that's how I recommend you study this topic. Diagrams, know how to label them. We'll be talking about the different layers as we go through the integument system and what we find in each layer. As I just explained, it's all about the layers. We're going to be talking about the epidermis and the five layers of the epidermis. Then we'll move a little deeper and get into the dermis, its two layers. And then we'll talk briefly about a layer that sits underneath the integument, not really part of the integument itself, the subcutaneous layer or hypodermis. Once we get through this, we'll then we'll get into the accessory structures of the integument, hair, nails, and glandular tissues. So when we think about the integument as a whole, we're talking about the skin, the largest single organ in the body. Two gross layers, an epidermis, which sits most superficial, made mostly of stratified squamous epithelial tissue. You recall that from our tissue discussion. And just below it is mostly a connective tissue layer called the dermis. We'll have two particular layers in the dermis meant to add flexibility and also anchor the epidermis down. And then deep to it again, we're looking at the subcutaneous layer. Again, not part of the skin, lies underneath the dermis, mostly composed of adipose tissue. So you can see already you, our, our tissue discussion is going to come in handy for this particular section. We'll look at that on a diagram, hence the purpose of taking this out of the classroom and onto the screen we get to see our epidermis superficially, purely epithelial tissue, anchored down onto the dermis at this wavy line you can see on the diagram by a basement membrane. Everything below it is our dermis. Connective tissue, you'll see that's going to store our, our, house, our blood vessels, accessory structures like most of our, our nervous system receptors, hair follicles extend deep into the dermis itself, glandular tissue, whether it be for sweat or oil into the hair follicles, all part of that dermal structure. And then again, deep to it, our subcutaneous layer. You will see this diagram or a diagram similar to it several times as we go through this topic, as we take one layer at a time. As you can imagine, for an organ that's mostly meant to separate your internal environment from the external environment in which you're found in, the integument is going to have several diverse functions. If when we talk protection, we can even look at that topic in a number of different contexts. Physical protection. It's going to be the physical barrier that separates you from your external environment. We can talk about protection from an immune standpoint. Later on, once you get into immune function in AMP2, we'll talk about the physical barriers, the acidic uh, layer of the surface of the skin, as well as other barriers, uh, vaginal walls, down the inside the esophagus and digestive system, down the inside of the lungs, all providing that initial physical barrier against anything penetrating through to infect the body. It's going to prevent water loss, particularly we'll see one layer of the epidermis that helps form a nice watertight barrier, or at least minimizes water loss. We get temperature regulation. We discussed as part of our feedback loops, at times when temperature changes in the body, we'll recruit blood vessels in the skin. So at times when the temperature has gotten too high, you will see the blood vessels in the skin dilate, bring more blood to the surface to dissipate heat. You'll also see other accessory structures like the sweat glands secrete their product onto the surface of the skin as it evaporates, it takes heat with it. And at times when the body gets too cold, you may even see the erector pili muscles associated with the hair follicles, making that hair stand on end and giving you that goosebump presentation. We have some metabolic regulation. We get a certain degree of hormonal activity that is going to deal with, with 
UV light hitting the skin, uh, vitamin D synthesis with UV light hitting the skin. We get a lot of our sensory reception, deep touch, light touch, pain receptors, all part of the skin, giving us varying degrees of tactile sensation. And we get a degree of excretion by means of secretion. So when your glandular tissue secretes sweat onto the surface of the skin, it's going to have a certain degree of salts associated with it. So we'll start superficial and we'll make our way deep. It's important that you realize when we're moving from one layer to the next to keep the functions distinct and separate. So the epidermis is purely epithelial tissue. Remember, epithelial tissue is that covering and lining tissue. Anywhere where the internal body meets the external environment, you will have a layer of epithelial tissue. Down the inside the esophagus, stomach, and GI tract, down the inside the lungs, and the outside the skin. Now, this tissue is purely avascular. There is no blood supply, no blood vessels to be found in the epidermal layers. And you may have even experienced that, you know, a very shallow paper cut, for example, may just take a shave of skin off. You get this kind of flap of skin without it bleeding. Basically means you did not cut deep enough through the epidermis and into the dermal tissues where the blood vessels will be found. Composed of keratinized stratified squamous epithelia. So a bit of a, a specialized stratified squamous structure on top of what we discussed in our tissue segment. This keratinization is gonna give a little bit more integrity and strength to that epidermal tissue. And it's composed of several layers. Now we'll talk about the number of layers that are gonna be present because it will vary from one place to another uh, in the body. So again, here is our epidermal structure. Everything from the very superficial part of the skin down to this purple wavy line, including the purple wavy line. Everything superficial to it is going to be epidermis. Within that section, we will have four or five distinctly separate layers. Now, I've listed them here from deep to superficial. So, of course, given the order that we have here, if we were to label them on a diagram as such, the stratum basilae at the top of the list is the deepest layer. But we start deep and we work superficial for these. The stratum basilae is a single layer of tissue, deepest layer of the epidermis. And of all the layers we'll talk about, of all the cells in the epidermis, these are the only ones capable of cellular replication. They're the only ones capable of mitosis. When we look at the unique nature of the epidermis and where it falls in relation to its blood supply, this should make sense. The more superficial we get, the further these cells are from their blood supply. So the more difficult time they will have to maintain their homeostasis. As we go through our layers and we look deep to the most superficial, essentially what we're going to be looking at is, for lack of a better term right now, the life cycle of those cells. We will see a new daughter cell spawn off from our stratum bacillae and it will migrate through these layers till by the time it reaches the stratum corneum, it is a long since dead fragmented cell. In the stratum bacillae, we see mostly keratinocytes. It's a squamous cell that modified keratinized structure. We see some melanocytes. Melanocytes are going to be the cells that produce the pigment melanin in response to UV light. That is a darker pigment. We've all experienced this at times when UV light increases skin pigmentation in the sense of a tan. And we get some tactile cells, which are sensitive to touch. These will be some of the most superficial uh, touch receptors, detecting any deformation in the tissue. So we've zoomed in on our epidermal layer as a whole. This single layer is our stratum bacillae. 
any of the cells that are superficial to it originated by way of mitosis from the stratum basilate. So as soon as one of these cells here will replicate, the daughter cell produced is immediately part of the very next layer out. We get another replication and it pushes that first daughter cell one step up again. So finally, if one cell in the stratum basilate were to replicate five times, stacked on top of it now towards the surface, we will get a stack of five cells with the oldest one being the one closest to the surface. The next layer out is the stratum spinosum. Now this layer is going to be several layers thick. I said as we move superficial, these cells are getting further and further and further from their blood supply. These cells are going to may have a harder time maintaining their homeostasis. And we see that already manifested in the presentation of the stratum spinosum. When you think about the term spinosum, these cells have a spiculated, spiky appearance. Back when we did cellular structure, we talked about the cytoskeleton inside of a cell. Internal framework. Well, if you have that internal framework present, but you lose volume in the cell and the cell kind of shrinks inward, you're going to start to see that internal framework pressing against the outside of the cell. And that's what we see in the stratum spinosum. The cells of the stratum spinosum are already starting to struggle because we've, we've moved away from their blood supply. They've already lost some cellular volume. And as a result, they take on this spiculated appearance. These are the immediate daughter cells from the stratum bacillae. Here we'll also see some epidermal dendritic cells. These are our immune system cells, ready to be part of that first physical barrier for recognition and support to anything trying to invade the body through the surface. So our stratum bacillae, everything from here, down to the stratum bacillae is stratum spinosum. Now, as those cells make their way through, their physical appearance is going to keep changing as they move further and further from the blood supply. At some point, we really start to see these cells break down. And at this point, let's face it, they are dead cells. As that cell is going to be ending its life, you are going to see the cytoplasm in the cell fill with these keratin filaments. The organelles are going to start to break down and the cell will take on this granular appearance. Kind of a, a, a spotted appearance. Hence the term granulosum. As the cell is dying, it's going to start secreting lipid components out into the extracellular fluid. This is where we will get a great deal of our waterproofing. This extracellular lipid being secreted into the extracellular spaces between the cells, starting to form a nice tight water barrier as these cells are breaking down. Stratum granulosum, much thinner than the stratum spinosum. But remember, these cells are breaking down now, so you're starting to see that entire layer kind of compact in. The stratum lucidum is going to be the layer that isn't always present. I said the epidermis will have four or five layers depending on where in the body it's found. We only find the stratum lucidum in palms of the hands and soles of the feet. Now, cells that would have been in the stratum bacillae in those parts of the body are a little bit modified. So that as those cells start to deteriorate, making its way to the surface, we get a distinct presentation at this layer in those parts of the body that we don't see elsewhere. These cells are going to have organelles that are filled with another substance called eledin. <laughs> 
And he leading will bring up again in just a moment. <clears throat> because it is important to remember that even though palms of the hands and soles of the feet, we call that thick skin. That skin is not thick because of the thickness of the stratum corneum, the stratum lucidum. A lot of students are going to think in the forearm, there's four layers. In the, in the palms of the hands, there's five layers. Therefore, that skin has to be 20% thicker. No. The stratum lucidum is a rather thin layer, especially when compared with other layers like the stratum spinosum. The stratum lucidum itself is a very thin layer. It is the production of a leaden in that stratum lucidum that contributes to the thicker skin. And when we look at that a little bit closer, hopefully that'll become just a little bit clearer. And the most superficial layer is the stratum corneum. Now we've already mentioned that the stratum granulosum cells were dead. Stratum lucidum cells, dead. It's not gonna get any more alive making its way further to the surface. At the stratum corneum, not only do we have dead cells, but we really have cellular fragments at that point. At the very superficial aspect of the skin, and abrasion, you basically get these cells slough off the surface, getting replaced by an ongoing replication of cells from below. Stratum vasillae, single layer deep, several layer thick stratum spinosum, a thinner stratum granulosum. These are all dead cells now breaking down, becoming granular, secreting lipids into the extracellular spaces. If present, an even thinner again, the stratum lucidum, secreting the protein in leaden, and the stratum corneum sitting most superficial. Fragmented cells that are sloughing off the surface, and by ongoing replication of the stratum bacillae, we maintain a certain thickness of skin. So speaking of thickness of skin, let's compare thick and thin skin. Again, I can't stress that it is not simply the presence of the stratum lucidum that makes thick skin thick. It is the thick skin's ability to produce that eleden that leads to a greater dimension <coughs> of skin thickness. Let's look at some slides, make that just a little bit clearer. On the right is thin skin. Here's your stratum bacillae, that dark purple. Stratum spinosum just out from that. Stratum granulosum just out from that again, thinner. Here is your stratum corneum. Now remember, thin skin doesn't have a stratum lucidum at all. But here's your stratum corneum. Look how weakly it's held. It almost looks like puff pastry. It looks delicate, right? When we compare that to thick skin, where the stratum lucidum is present, here's our stratum bacillae, way down deep here. Our stratum spinosum, just above it. Here's our stratum lucidum. All of this section here is stratum corneum. So thick skin may have that extra layer, but this thick skin is really that much thicker because of the increased dimensions of the stratum corneum. And we haven't even taken into account the magnification. So the difference is even greater than the picture suggests. When we see a leaden secreted by the stratum lucidum, it acts as a glue. And it makes for a much thicker, robust stratum corneum. Remember, that stratum corneum layer is constantly being abrased off of there. With the aledin, it can take a lot more abuse, leading to it building up to a thicker, more dense structure. So thick skin found on the palms of the hands, soles of the feet. We do have that distinct stratum lucidum present, but really it's the enormous difference in the stratum corneum that makes thick skin physically thicker. We see some variations in the epidermis. And a lot of that is going to be based on differences in pigment. 
hemoglobin. It's a pigment in the blood. It's red in color. And of course, we will see how much of that pigment shows through based on the pigment of the epidermis. So darker skinned people, you see much less of that hemoglobin pigment showing through. Someone who has no pigment in the epidermis, someone, somebody with albinism, you'll see several parts of their body will actually take on a pinkish color because of the hemoglobin that's to, able to show through much more easily through, through the much more transparent epidermis. Melanin will produce darker skin depending on the production. Caucasian populations will have a certain number of melanocytes producing a certain amount of melanin, and we can see a distinct change in skin tone based on UV light exposure. It is the UV light exposure that increases or decreases the production of melanin. Now, someone with much darker skin, whether they be African American population or Hispanic population, Native American population, their melanocytes are going to naturally be secreting more melanin. So they will take on a much darker skin tone. Not quite as responsive to UV light changes uh, like a Caucasian skin would be. And next up, we have carotene. Now, we mentioned, we mentioned carotene, not so much for its natural function to color the skin, but more so to point out that certain pigments can be stored in these epidermal tissues, in dermal tissues, therefore changing the appearance of the skin. And carotene is one of them. Carotene is that yellowish orange pigment, of course, found in, in carrots, hence, hence the name that can tend to build up in skin over time. I normally tell a story uh, of a friend of mine who was selling these vitamin products and he was gone all in with it and had started taking mega doses of this stuff for himself because he thought it was the, the next best thing. And slowly he didn't even realize it, but his skin was turning orange. And if he hadn't seen him for a while, it was shockingly orange. He looked like a character from the Simpsons cartoons or something that had built up and stored in the structures of the integument and even the, the adipose tissues underneath. This diagram indicates the production and distribution of the melanin. Melanocytes forming these appendages that reach out into the tissues immediately around it carrying their produced melanin to the keratinocytes immediately adjacent. Now, unlike the way this diagram looks, you will see more of that melanin along the superficial aspect of the cell. If this is the superficial aspect up here, remember UV light's coming in from this angle. You'd arrange the melanin along that aspect of the cell to help protect against the UV light that's coming through from the surface. Now, of course, there's any other number of skin colorations that we could talk about. Not really a topic that we need to get into real deep here. We already mentioned albinism. Cyanosis, if there's a lack of blood supply, the skin can take on a, a bluish tinge. And of course, with cyanosis, you may already recognize that certain Parts of the body are going to be more prone to that discoloration, right? Lips in particular. You tend to see a cyanosis real uh, 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 apparent more so than some other parts of the body. Jaundice. Elevated levels of bilirubin. If you're having the liver dysfunction, you're not breaking down those red blood cells appropriately. Just like we saw with cyanosis certain parts of the body that you get that yellowish jaundice color much more apparent. The sclera of the eyes where they are so white can be a little bit more shockingly yellow than say skin tone unless the skin tone happens to be lighter. 
Now, when we talk about variations in the epidermis, I don't want to imply that these are abnormalities. They are simply normal variations. A nevus or a mole. Some people may have none, some may have a couple, some may have several. There's no overgrowth of melanocytes. Now, of course, melanocytes come in front, you know, from the, the term melanoma. Any nevus structures, we do want to make sure that they're not changing over time, that the, the borders aren't becoming irregular. It might be an indication that that's not just a nevus, but an overgrowth of melanocytes that are continuing to proliferate. You could have an hemangioma, proliferation of blood vessels. Actually, um, technically, it's a benign tumor. And I want to draw your attention to this term in particular, friction ridges. These are, in a sense, your, your fingerprints or any other fold on the surface where you would see thick skin. Now, everybody has them. Everybody's is different. Hence why I want to make sure you picture these are variations, not abnormalities. This term in particular, pay close attention to this term because we'll be mentioning another term shortly that is often confused with this one. The terminology leads, leads to that conclusion. So here's your friction ridges. They're for grip, increased integrity of the skin. So that's our epidermis are four or five layers, depending on where we are in the body. Now we're down into the dermis. It's primarily a connective tissue layer, where we see the bulk of our accessory structures associated with it. The most superficial part of the dermis is called the papillary layer. While we get below, we're into the reticular layer. Now, as I picture these, I, I actually prefer to not call them distinct layers, more so the papillary region or the reticular region of the dermis, because this is a bit of a spectrum, a little bit of a gradient rather than a, a hard layer border. The papillary layer is going to have a lot of areolar connective tissue. Remember from our discussion on tissues, it is a loose connective tissue. While it may not be that strong, it is extremely pliable. Picture your arm as you bend your arm. You want the skin to stretch over that point of the elbow and compress on the inside of the elbow. You straighten the arm, you want the opposite to occur. You need a certain degree of rigidity and flexibility in the skin, and the papillary layer with its areolar connective tissue is going to offer that. We get a little deeper in the reticular layer. Now we're talking about dense, irregular connective tissue, giving us a little bit more integrity to anchor that der uh, epidermis down. Now, like I said, we don't really have a hard border between our papillary and our reticular layers. But generally speaking, here's what I've encouraged people to do. You kind of see where this is here. If we draw a line roughly along the bottoms of each of these undulations, right? You see this wavy purple line, peaks and valleys, right? If you draw a line across the bottom of all the valleys, you're roughly going to be where we distinguish the papillary layer from the reticular layer. If you're in lab and it's labeled on a model, try not to split hairs on this. If we want you to know the reticular layer, we're going to be labeling it down here somewhere. We're labeling it up here. Just go with papillary. But think about the term, papillary. We'll see that term pop up as a descriptive term for something that has a finger-like structure to it. And that's what we see in the papillary layer. As we spread these layers apart, of course, we can't really do that. That's ridiculous. But if we take our epidermis and we pull it off, you will see they imbricate over one another. Like that egg carton foam with its bumps and corrugated surface. If we took two of those and faced the bumpy sides towards each other, they would kind of nestle into each other a little bit. 
That's what we see at the junction between the epidermis and the dermis, with each of these structures from the papillary layer looking like a finger projection heading upward. Those finger projections are called dermal papillae. Its corresponding structure in the epidermis pointing downward, also finger-like projections, we call them epidermal ridges. Now this is the term that gets confused with the friction ridge term before. Epidermal, implying it's in the epidermis, and it is. Friction ridges are on the surface here. Epidermal ridges are the deepest portion of the epidermis down here. So try not to get those two confused based on its terms. So the epidermis and the dermis imbricate with each other by way of the dermal papillae from the dermis and the epidermal ridges of the epidermis. Now I'm going to switch to a whiteboard here real quick and look at the importance of that. Let's draw a single dermal papillae. And of course, deep in there, we've got our blood flow. Arteries, veins, and a nice transition from oxygenated to deoxygenated blood, right? Now out here, Remember, we have all of our cells. These are all of our keratinocytes making up the stratum spinosum. Our stratum bacillae is that single layer that's going to sit right in through here. Of course, I don't need to draw all of these, right? What the dermal papillae does is it really accomplishes two things with this structure. Number one, it increases strength. It increases integrity. You get a much stronger junction between the epidermis and the dermis with this imbricating structure. The second is a blood flow issue. Remember, we already see struggle with the cells of the epidermis because we're getting further from their blood supply. This papillary shape at least minimizes that. We draw the rest of this epidermal structure here, realizing we'll head into another dermal papillae there. We get to innervate some of that skin with blood from multiple angles. So any of the cells out here now, you're going to get some penetration here here, here, of course the blood vessels that will be in the next dermal papillae will attack it from, not attack it, but provide from the other side. So rather than us only being able to penetrate and supply cells in one, two, or three cell layers out, by giving some provisions from both aspects here, three-dimensionally kind of, we get a much greater supply of blood to those deepest layers of the epidermis. Still not ideal, obviously, but when we already see the cells of the stratum spinosum struggle like they do, any supply from the deeper layers of the blood vessels is going to be most welcome. The reticular layer, as I said, dense irregular connective tissue. Now, this is the layer of the dermis that gives us much more strength and integrity to the integument as a whole. This is where we'll find some of the deeper accessory structures, like the hair follicles, the glandular tissues. This is where we will find the nerve receptors for deep touch. Whenever we talk about nerve receptors in the skin, it's all about sensing tissue deformation. 
you run your fingers over something real fine, any skin deformation is still going to be very superficial. And it's going to disturb those particular skin receptors. Take this sensory receptor deep in the skin. We need a lot of pressure just to get to it. So hence, this receptor is going to detect more deep touch. Now, found within this reticular layer in particular are going to be denser arrangements of collagen and elastic fibers. They're generally going to be oriented in parallel bundles along expected vectors of stress. Now, we wind up calling these lines of cleavage, <coughs> kind of to address where these are oriented at. And you will see and you'll experience some of this practically when it comes to whether or not an open wound needs to have stitches or whether or not it will kind of retain its closed structure and, and heal itself. Anytime these collagen fibers are stretched, they do not have an elastic quality. They're not meant to stretch a whole lot, that they're not elastic, so when they do stretch, they're going to maintain that new resting length, and that's where we're going to see stretch marks or striae form as part of that dermal uh, breakdown. If we have an incision across our lines of cleavage, you will see these collagen fibers will pull away once they get cut, leading to an open wound that's much more difficult to heal on itself. These are the wounds that are going to need those stitches, even if it's a small one. However, a one that goes parallel in between those lines of cleavage, you're disturbing less collagen fibers, less of a reaction to it to pull apart, therefore less likely to need an actual stitch. Because there's less destruction of the dermis, we're going to see less of a scar formation once it heals. So any surgical applications, you will tend to see them choose their lines of incision based on where the anticipated lines of cleavage are. Somebody who has had a cesarean section, you will typically see that along those lines of cleavage, kind of in that, let's say, smiley face kind of appearance, but that lower curvature. Any other uh, incision, you will see follow whatever they expect the lines of, of cleavage to be whenever possible. Now, just like any other blood vessel that you guys are going to talk about over the next several months, the blood vessels going to the skin are going to be supplied by your autonomic nervous system for constriction and dilation. Basoconstriction implies that blood vessel is getting smaller limiting the amount of blood getting to the area, increasing its resistance. You want more blood to get to the area, you vasodilate, you make that blood vessel larger. Now, the subcutaneous layer, or the hypodermis, as we said, is not part of the integument, but you get to, you get to a problem here with where else do we include it, at least when it comes to the integument and the skin or at least in the general vicinity, so we might as well throw that information in here now. Deep to the integument, but not part of the integument. We have some areolar connective tissue, but quite a bit of adipose tissue. This is a fat storage. Now, when it comes to function, you'll see me take issue with some of these uh, functions. We'll do this on several systems. Does it protect underlying structures? Absolutely. There's nothing like a layer of fat to buffer any physical abuse. As a matter of fact, you'll see organs like the kidneys, for example, often be surrounded with a layer of fat to protect against any trauma. Uh, thermal insulation. Yeah, sure. Again, it's increased thickness of the tissues. You're going to have a better chance retaining heat with a nice thick subcutaneous layer than you would without it. The function I have a little bit more of an issue with is stored energy. Uh, the reason I have an issue with that function, I mean, if, if it's on the list on an exam, yeah, check it off. 
but I always want us to think about the actual functions here. If you are storing adipose tissue as energy, you're implying you want to get that energy back. Any fat in the subcutaneous layer, however, is some of the most difficult fat stores to tap into when needed. So many other stores in the body are more readily available when you need the energy than the energy stored in adipose tissue. Even people who have extremely low body fat can still have a reasonable subcutaneous layer. Bodybuilders who, let's face it, are, are genetically gifted when it comes to their ability to get to ridiculously low body fat levels to see those muscle striations. Even when they're planning for a competition, they try and time that competition with their, their preparation because they could never maintain those extreme low levels of, of subcutaneous tissue for long periods of time. So to call it a, a stored energy, I don't consider it much of a store if it's that difficult to tap into. You know, you, you put your money in a bank to store it. But if it took five years to get that money out, that's not going to be a, a very practical means of storage. It's not readily accessible. And neither is the fat stored in the subcutaneous layer when it comes to energy production. Now we get into the accessory structures. Just like the skin, I would encourage you to study these as diagrams. Get yourself a diagram of the skin. Get yourself a diagram of the hair, the nail, <coughs> and label it, and label it again, and label it again, and again, and again. This integument system is 90% structure. Then you go back and memorize the nuances of each layer. And just location alone helps intuitively understand the structure. So knowing where it is is already a step in the right direction. With the nail, we're even going to skip the wording here and go straight to the diagram. I encourage you to divide the nail up into two groups of terms. Essentially, a group of terms that you see from this perspective and a group of terms that happen to be deep. So when you look at the nail as if you were looking down at a painted fingernail from this perspective. The bulk of that structure is the nail body. It's everything from where the nail dives underneath the skin, called the eponychium or the cuticle, all the way to the very edge of the nail, the part that you would use if you were scratching your back. The part of the nail body that extends beyond the underside is called the free edge. This is the part that you would clip if your nails were getting too long. So the nail body is the entire structure from the free edge all the way down to the eponychium. The free edge is part of the body, but it's the part that overhangs. The lanula is more of an opaque structure at the base of the nail. It's a little bit thicker, a little less transparent, therefore you don't see the hemoglobin pigment showing through. So those are your superficial terms. Now you look underneath. You had the nail body. The nail body lays on the nail bed. As we dive underneath the skin, we have a continuation of the body. But once you pass that cuticle, now it's called the nail root, 
and associated with the nail root is part of the nail bed called the nail matrix. And that entire structure is termed nail plate. So let's go back and recategorize here now. You have the entire visible portion of the nail, which is the nail body, with two other specialized portions, the free edge and the lanula. If we continue following that structure underneath the skin, we see the nail body continues underneath the skin as the nail root. The entire body sits on the nail bed. The most proximal portion of the nail bed is called the nail matrix. This is where all nail growth is going to originate from. So compartmentalize them in that way and it'll make it a little bit easier to label. Practice labeling them on a diagram. If you know where they are on the diagram, you will know where they are if I describe the structure. Hair, same way. Study it the exact same way. Study it with a diagram. First, we got regions, the bulb, the root, and the shaft as we go from deep to superficial and beyond, I guess. The shaft, when I say superficial and beyond, because the shaft extends off the surface. Any visible part of the hair is the hair shaft. Now, the next part down is going to be the hair root, but I'm going to skip the hair root for a moment and go straight to the hair bulb. Now, I don't mean to define a term with the same term, but the hair bulb is bulbous. You can see as we continue down the root, it flares out into a much more rounded portion. Where it starts to flare out is where we get the hair bulb. And we skip the root because once we define where the bulb is, it's easier to see where the root begins. And the root will be everything from where the bulb stops all the way up to the surface of the skin. We see two other accessory structures associated with the hair. Erector pili muscles. When they constrict, pulls the hair on in, then you get this goosebump sensation. We also get sebaceous glands. Sebaceous glands are oil secreting glands that secrete their product into the hair follicle. The hair follicle is going to be the, the sheath that the hair root and the hair bulb sits in. So it's going to secrete it into the hair follicle. As the hair grows up out of that follicle, it brings that oily substance with it. Inside the bulb, we have a finger-like projection, papilla. That term popped up earlier, right? It's a finger-like structure. This time it's a hair papilla extending up into the bulb. That hair papilla carries nerve endings, carries blood vessels up into the bulb of the hair to provide the nutrients we need for hair growth. And any hair growth is going to come from the matrix of the hair bulb. We had a matrix of the, the nail, we have a matrix of the hair bulb. Now, when it comes to functions of hair, I'll, I'll also take issue with some of these functions, I guess, just like I did with adipose tissue in the uh, subcutaneous. Because arguably, we, we may be just looking for functions when it comes to picking these out. First of all, protection. I will probably admit that if you have a really dense full head of hair, you're probably more protected from bumping your head off of something than somebody who has no hair at all. Fair enough. But you're talking about protection from a rather specific thing. I think you're looking for functions when that one pops up. Same goes for heat retention. Now, on a cold day, yeah, you would probably rather have a nice coating of fur. However, we don't really depend on 
a layer of hair for heat retention. Maybe with the exception of the, head, the hair on your head, because you do lose quite a bit of heat through the head. Now, we do use hair for sensory reception. Some of the most detailed sensory receptors for light touch are associated with the hair follicles. The slightest little disturbance in that hair position is going to be felt and received by those sensory receptors. Visual identification. I've read articles that talked about the nature of the hair on the head and the face being some of the most stark visual indicators for identification. Facial hair, hair color, hair length. So basically, if you're going to, to rob a bank, first thing you should probably do if you don't want to get caught is, is, is get a dramatically different hairstyle, different color, and, and shave off the beard. And next up is the chemical signal dispersal. As part of those uh, sebaceous glands, we do see certain chemicals that are in there that are going to be brought to the surface that are going to be very characteristic for the individual. So when we talk about maybe even uh, on, a, on a subliminal uh, scale, different chemical dispersals that can be picked up by other people. Now, we have some glandular tissues associated with the skin. Now, it's important to realize this is not the part of the endocrine system. Endocrine glands produce hormones that are secreted into the blood. These are exocrine glands. They produce a product that are secreted either into a body cavity or onto a body surface. Hormones are used for messaging and regulation. Any product from an exocrine gland is not. We have our sudoriferous glands. These are our sweat glands. And we're going to look at, at two different types, merocrine and apocrine sweat glands. Merocrine sweat glands, also called ecrine, by the way, these are the ones that are more evenly distributed over the body. Their secretions are by far mostly water, maybe some salts, but very clear, very watery in consistency. This is going to be the type of sweat that you will produce for thermoregulation. On a hot day, you sweat, it evaporates, it cools you. Apocrine are going to be the sweat glands that are found more so in the axillary regions and in the pubic regions. Now, its secretion is going to be a lot more viscous. It's a lot thicker of a secretion. And this is going to be the sweat that's going to be more associated with an odor. Now, when we look at one type of sweat versus the other, really the reason one supports more bacterial growth is more based on its mode of secretion. A merocrine sweat gland, let's, let's just draw the whole tissue here. Let's draw a band of columnar cells that will be part of a merocrine gland. They're going to have little vesicles inside the cell. These vesicles will migrate to the surface of the cell and by way of exocytosis, dump their product onto the surface. So the vesicles are simply opening up and dumping the product, the sweat. Apocrine glands, and I'll just draw one of them here for this one, also have vesicles. Up to this point, they look much like the merocrine glands would. But instead of by exocytosis, basically what we get in an apricot gland is the entire top of the cell is going to slough off 
Now, all of this is part of its secretion. Not only what was found in the vesicles, but the lipid structure making up the membranes, any proteins that was part of the intracellular fluid here. So this is going to be a much more high lipid, high protein composition than sweat from the mirocrines. And of course, if you want to support bacterial growth, you give it lipid structures and protein structures on which it can remain nourished on. The sebaceous glands, as I said, is more of a, an oily substance. Sebum is secreted by the sebaceous glands into the follicle, and as the hair grows, it drags it with it. Now, these are going to be relatively inactive in childhood. Right? You, you may find a kid who's 12, 13, 14, you know, you don't need to wash your hair as often. You get a little older and the sebaceous glands become more active, producing more oil, and certainly does. So there is our integument and accessory structures. I can't stress this enough to study this anatomy using diagrams first. Get the layers of the skin down. Then go back and study what each layer is. And by already knowing where it is, it will help you with the finer details of it. So less memorization, more intuitive learning. Do the exact same thing with the hair and the skin. Very few times will I be able to ask you a question using words that you won't be able to answer simply by studying it in a diagram format. You're not going to have this luxury on many of the systems that we're going to do. Please take advantage of it for the integument. It'll work out better for you that way. And if you have any questions, please let me know. We're going to move on from the integument into whole new systems. We don't spend too long on the integument. But really, picture it as a carryover from our tissue discussion and study it from an anatomical perspective.